This was what happened. There was a man called Theron, a scoundrel, whose criminal trade it was to sail the seas and have thugs handily stationed with boats and harbors under cover of being ferrymen. From them, he made up pirate crews. Theron had been about at the funeral. His gaze had fastened on the gold, and when he went to bed that night, he could not sleep for thinking, why should I risk my life battling with the sea and killing living people and not getting much out of it when I can get rich from one dead body? Let the die be cast. I won't miss a chance like that of making money. Now, whom shall I recruit for the job? Think. Theron, who would be suitable? Of the men you know, Xenophanes of Thuri, intelligent but a coward. Memnon of Masana, brave but untrustworthy. He assessed each one in turn, like a man testing coins. Many he rejected, but he did think some suitable. So at dawn, he hurried to the harbor and began looking them out one by one. Some of them he found in brothels, others in taverns, an army fit for such a commander. Saying that he had something important to talk to them about, he took them behind the harbor and began as follows. I have made a rich find, and I have picked you out from everybody else to share it with me. There's nothing in this for more than one. There's enough in this for more than one, and it doesn't need much effort either. One night can make us all rich. We aren't novices at this kind of business. Fools condemn it, but sensible men find it pays. They saw at once that it was robbery with violence he was proposing, or breaking into a tomb, or robbing a temple. Never mind preaching to our converted they cried, just tell us what the job is, and let's not miss our chance. Theron went on, you've seen the gold and silver with the body, he said. We ought to have it by rights, we're alive. My idea then is to open the vault at night, load our ship, sail wherever the wind takes us, and sell the cargo as we can. They agreed. Well then, he said, Go about your ordinary business for the time being. When it's dark, each of you make its way to the ship and bring a builder's tool. This, then, was what the robbers did. As for Claraho, she came back to life. Her respiration had stopped, but lack of food started it again. With difficulty and gradually, she began to breathe. Then she began to move her body limb by limb. Then she opened her eyes and came to her senses like someone waking up from sleep, and thinking Charius was sleeping beside her, she called to him. But since neither husband nor maids paid any attention, and everything was lonely and dark, the girl began to shiver and tremble with fear. She could not work out what had really happened. She stirred into consciousness, she touched wreaths and ribbons, and made gold and silver objects rattle and there was a strong smell of spices. So then she remembered the kick, and how it had made her fall, and she eventually realized that she had been buried as a result of losing consciousness. She cried out at the top of her voice, I have been buried alive, help. She shouted many times, but nothing happened, and then she abandoned all further hope of being rescued. Sinking her head into her lap, she fell to bewailing her lot. Oh, what a terrible fate, she sobbed, buried alive. I haven't done anything wrong, dying a lingering death. They're mourning for me, and there's nothing wrong with me. Who will send a messenger? Who will be the messenger? Wicked Charius, I blame you, not for killing me, but for being so quick to remove me from the house. You should not have buried Calarejo quickly, even if she had really been dead but perhaps you already have plans for marriage.